Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's a real pleasure to see so many of you here. And um, welcome to the last session of our, our first day. Um, for those of you that know Martin Mannion, who's listed as the moderator, will recognize I'm an imposter. Um, sadly, uh, Martin, Martin's not feeling very well this afternoon, so uh, uh, I've been asked to step in at uh, short notice. For, uh, to fill his place. We're all part of a group called Independent Port Consultants Group, so it's, it's, a, it's a good, good demonstration of our, of our abilities to, um, to step in when help is needed. Um, the um, the organisers uh, were speaking to me last week and they said, Steve, we need you to be in good physical uh, form for TOC because it's, you know, it's a hard grind over a few days. So I thought some light gardening over the weekend was the sort of exercise that would um, do the trick. Unfortunately, I I've uh, hurt my back. So it I have to apologize in advance because if during the presentations you hear me groaning, go, oh, I have to assure you it's got nothing to do with the quality of the speakers, okay? And that's the best excuse I've ever had. So, um, it's a great to be here this afternoon. We're covering port infrastructure and interoperability. We've got a terrific uh, set of speakers lined up for you. Um, Alex uh, Pico, Managing Director of Circle Group. He's uh, working on something called the Ealing Project, which was something I thought was near me in West London. Uh, so he's had to explain that patiently to me. Uh, but he's going to be looking at onshore, onshore power. Ricardo Arten, who's the CEO of Brazil, Terminals Portuero, and we'll be hearing more about Brazil as a developing market tomorrow. Uh, Pablo Red do Real, who's the managing partner of ALG. Hans Rook, chairman of International Port Community Systems Association. Uh, and uh, last but not least, Jaron Katz, who's the project director, design and simulation from the TBA group. And between them all, they're going to be looking at uh, cross docking and interoperability. We're going to be looking at onshore power supply and a whole range of other processes and investments are needed to make uh, uh, port infrastructure work. So without further ado, uh, oh, and I should say that there'll be plenty of time for Q&A when we've finished and uh, there'll be no beer for any of you until you've asked at least three decent questions, okay? And I can see at least one journalist in the audience, so there's no excuse for there not being any good questions this afternoon. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Alexio Pico to um, come and take the stage. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My, my role, uh, uh, my 10 minutes today is just to uh, to speak about something a little bit different from uh, my uh, distinguished speakers later. So it's about ELIM project, that is uh, a project about cold ironing imports funded by the, uh, co-funded by the European Union in the Connecting Euro Facility uh, program. So let me see if this working. Should work, but it's not. So this is the, the number of ports that are working in this project. There are 17 ports uh, across uh, Europe. Uh, why they work together? They work together, of course, because they want to introduce cold ironing on shore power supply in their port, but also because they want uh, to, to work a little bit uh, in the first two activities. That is, working together to have a better harmonized framework for the cold ironing in Europe. Because as uh, you are going to see, the situation is quite much different. Uh, there is a lot of money available in many countries for that, meaning that on shore power supply could be implemented almost everywhere. But of course, it is needed to understand where it is really useful, how to do it, technically speaking, how to do it on, from the energy side, how to do it from the tax side, the, the price of the electricity, and so on. And, so, and of course, how to adapt the maritime fleet to that, because it's always the issue of the chicken and egg. So offer and demand should come together. Let's see what we, we did uh, so far. The project is still going on. It's going to last until mid-2023, in which we are going to publish the final, uh, let's say, result, meaning the report on recommendations for the European Union for an harmonized development of, of the sector. We did so far uh, two things on the port side. An execute, uh, a port questionnaire uh, sent to a number of ports in Europe, and also a detailed analysis of the existing national framework, port regulation about cold ironing. Uh, 
I'm going to show something on the, of uh, some results of this. The questionnaire was sent to uh, more than 50, around 100 ports, but 54 uh, responded. Uh, so it's uh, statistically speaking, is certainly a good sample. Uh, we, we had a number of things uh, treated by the, the questionnaire, meaning the technical aspects related to onshore power supply, the regula regulatory and administrative aspects, such other aspects such as building facilities, knowledge, training that are needed, and additional information. Let's go to some, uh, let's say, a few results. Uh, here is the number of terminals, at least in the 50 ports we are talking, and so that, then you have to exploit, uh, to, to considering that in, in, in Europe we have only con the, uh, considering the first two layers of port, uh, meaning the core and comprehensive ports of the trans-European network for transport, we have 335. Uh, ports. So only consider these 54, we have 155 terminals uh, with OPS uh, f f facilities planned. And as you see from this um, uh, picture, uh, the, the, the type of terminal is quite different. Uh, we are talking about 28 container terminals, uh, 24 crews, and, and many others. And you know quite well that means different vessels coming uh, with different, totally different requirements in terms of power, in terms of uh, energy demand, in terms of lands, in whatever. So this means uh, that it's not that easy to have a sim. It, it may uh, seem as simple, and I think politicians they find a lot, uh, fund a lot this because they see this very simple. It's a plug, <laughs> it's a plug in the vessel. But of course, this is not uh, so simple. Uh, the main point, one of the, the key, po uh, key questions for, for the polls was, okay, which kind of main technical operational financial difficulties in planning and implementing OPS solutions you, you could see? Uh, of course, cost of installations. That I may say that now is a little bit declining this barrier for the fact that, again, uh, funding is, is available. Uh, in, I can tell you a, a cl a one example that is my country, Italy, in which uh, due to the National Re Recovery and Resilience Plan, uh, and a very big amount of money is planned for, for this. Meaning that the cost is not eerie in even the main point, but the, then it's becoming who is really you know, managing uh, the governance of the system is, is becoming who is selling the energy and who is deciding the strategy in terms of incentives uh, for, for this is becoming the issue. Uh, of course, the technical, some technical things in terms of the capacity of the grid is important because uh, the, the grid, in, in many grids in ports, I mean, they were designed not for this. They were designed for other things, for sure, even from the energy side, maybe demanding, uh, and even more demanding in the last year, such as cranes, but not designed for this. So in many ports, even big ports, the grid should be uh, expanded in order to... Um, uh, to make it happen. There is a lack of technical expertise and, and operational expertise. Uh, ports are becoming more and more energy apps for everything that is related to the energy transition we are living or the Green Deal policy. But still, they lack a little, they lack a bit of, you know, capacity in, in, uh, in developing, technically speaking, those systems. Uh, role responsibility expectations uh, is, is really important and incentives. The, the way in which the energy will be sold, there is a, a EU directive coming on energy uh, in terms of taxation of the energy, or on the other hand, which kind of incentives you can give to vessels already equipped for, for this. This is a totally non-harmonized framework uh, all over Europe. A lack of legislative drivers, you will see later on this. And also, um, the selection of who is going to provide the service is still seen at least as a, as a, as a, as a barrier. The other uh, analysis we did in the project is to, to have a look to the national, uh, regional, or port regulations directly or undoubtedly related to the short side electricity. We did a little bit of, uh, let's say, analysis of the countries involved in the, in the, in the project. And the, as you can see from this table, uh, some countries, they have already, let's say, a, a legislative framework that is, is very good in order to have uh, something developed uh, let's say, in an harmonized way uh, all, over you, uh, all over the country, some of, that, some of them not. That makes difficult the life of the providers, of course, of the energy sector, but also from the uh, maritime side, the vessel side. Uh, it makes it uh, not easy to understand where they have to invest and how, depending also 
the, 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 um, the possibilities that the different countries and regions have in, in implementing uh, OPS. So still a lot of work to do. Uh, we did also another questionnaire uh, on the maritime fleet adaptation, meaning that this time we, we asked shipping companies to, to reply and to, uh, to give some evidence of, of, the, of the issues. And also a specific one that I'm not treating uh, today the, on classification society, class society, and, and also uh, flag, um, flag entities. Again, also, the, in terms of the uh, information required for, uh, from shipping companies, we asked a number of things on the, on the technical aspects related to OPS and also regulatory and administrative aspects. I may say that, I mean, the, the, the answer, even more or less the sample we, we sent, the, the question was similar to the port, uh, the, the answers were not the same. Uh, there is a little bit of reluctancy uh, from the uh, maritime sector to, to be totally, let me say, open in this respect. And this is a pity because uh, sometimes, I mean, the, the two things should, should, should really go in, in parallel. In this, in this respect, I can give you a, a clear example on how also uh, some complaints are, are running in Europe, but there are examples in which uh, in, the Baltic can, in some Baltic countries, the regulatory framework is really... Uh, done in a way in which you could implement OPS only when you have the written agreement of the shipping companies to have the, the, the vessels equipped. Otherwise, you are not doing anything. And this is not happening elsewhere, and, and this could give a, a bit of, a, of issues. But coming back to the shipping, this is the, from the shipping side, the so-called maturity level of, uh, of OPS, meaning that a number of, uh, of companies they, they have already available in ships, uh, the, 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 the OPS uh, facility, uh, at, at something they are planned, but half of them, 50%, this is more or less 50%, the, the, blue, the big blue one, uh, still they have the ambition to do it, they have the, in, the, in the strategic plan, but still they have not decided to do anything. That is not exactly uh, going as, in principle, OPS is going to be developed in ports. At the same time, it's also true that shipping companies, they have to face an incredible numbers of options now in terms of, what, let me say, alternative fuels or decarbonization opportunities. And this is only one of them, but even in terms of uh, cold ironing, so meaning switching off the engines in the ports, at least some of them, they are doing something different. They, they, they have batteries on board that they could recharge during the, the trip, and they can switch off the engine in the port and using the batteries. So they say, okay, we don't need any <laughs> plug, we don't need to pay the energy because we are uh, self-sufficient in ports. And still, this is a little bit of uh, controversial. That's also why probably some of them, they, are, they have this ambition included in strategic plan, not really decided. Also taken into consideration that they have many other choices to be done in terms of new vessels meaning, okay, new buildings, meaning, okay, which kind of alternative fuel am I going to choose? Am I going to LNG that is still anyhow transition? Am I going to ammonia that is uh, still facing issues? Hydrogen for big ships is still something to come. Maybe for smaller, it's something more feasible uh, in a cut in, in few years. So this is uh, what, uh, th these are the barriers that they, they reported to us. Uh, so let me check the time. Okay, I need to finish. Uh, these are the barriers that uh, they report. The cost of electricity is still uh, an issue because it's totally different in terms of uh, uh, port by port, in terms of taxation, in terms of incentives. Uh, it's still very difficult to, 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 to decide what to do. Uh, of course, the, the availability of facilities. And also, the, 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 the one of the last one I, I think is, is important because uh, it's something that if you are in the maritime sector, you know quite well. Uh, there are strict class uh, classification society requirements and safety and security aspects that sometimes are, you know, uh, maybe not taken into the right consideration before, uh, you know, uh, supporting this sector to, 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 to evolve. And still, dubs from stakeholders involved is more or less what I told you. Uh, from the shipping side, the many alternatives they have. Uh, I'm going to skip this one because I'm already late. I don't want to take it. You are going to see it. But anyhow, 
Uh, you see again the issue of tax and incentives that is a key point in terms of uh, who is selling energy, which price of energy, which taxation and which incentives. This is a key issue and currently the sector is different really port by port. I think this was the last one, so thanks so much for your attention. If you have any questions later on, I would be happy to, to answer. Thanks a lot. Alex, thank you very much indeed for an excellent presentation and also for keeping to time, which is highly appreciated uh, indeed. Um, our next speaker is Ricardo Artin. He's the CEO of Brazil Terminal Portuero, BTP. We're going to be talking about developing markets tomorrow. And as, as uh, in our business, we've done some due diligence on major ports in Brazil in the last 12 months. It's interesting to see just what a dynamic market it is and um, you know, the returns on investment make it very attractive. And uh, Ricardo is going to tell us some more. So thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, my name is Ricardo Artin. I'm a CEO of BTP, Brazil Terminal uh, Portuario. Uh, the most beautiful, at least, terminal in, in, in Brazil. Uh, actually, it's a state-of-art terminal. Uh, we are doing more than uh, 2 million TUs uh, per year. Last year, we almost reached 2 million TUs in throughput. Um, I'm Brazilian, so of course I'm going to talk about Brazil. Uh, of course, uh, it is a TOC Europe, but of course I'm going to talk about Brazil. That's my uh, main focus at this point of time. So. Um, the, uh, the topic here is about capaci capacity and also competitiveness, right? So I could talk about uh, the technical details on, of course, this is easy. Uh, as, as higher that we have, uh, as more capacity we have, uh, more efficient we are as a terminal. Uh, more, let's say, uh, the, the dynamics is much better. We can produce better. The productivity is much better. And then... Uh, I'm going to challenge the, my competitor to do the best also. Otherwise, they will be behind. And this is a very good, uh, uh, a positive snowball, if it's, uh, it's the right word. It's a positive trend. So once I become more competitive, my competitor will do the same. So I, I honestly, I, I could talk about the, uh, the trends, the main drivers, the expansion in the port infrastructure in Brazil. Um, there are many projects, PTP, uh, for instance, we have our own project to expand our terminal, to extend our concession. Uh, of course, it is a huge project. We are intending to uh, uh, invest in Brazil more $300 million. We have spent already $1.2 billion, uh, and we would, would like to spend more money uh, and get uh, the second leg of our concession period. Uh, of course, this is uh, when we do that, we are going to, uh, those investments that we want to do, of course, the ESG is on, is on the top uh, of our uh, investment plan list. Uh, we are going to buy e-equipment, so RTGs, uh, STS are, is already uh, electric, but uh, all RTGs, uh, the TTs, uh, uh, all equipments will be electric. So we are going to this direction and our ambition is to be 100% uh, free carbon in, as from 2032. That's our ambition. Um, of course, training and processes uh, are very relevant in this uh, uh, to get more, uh, uh, to be more competitive, right? But of course, investments is crucial. So this is what we are trying to focus at this point of time and get the second leg of our, ex our, of our uh, concession. So we also could talk about the, um, the, what are the main uh, projects uh, between uh, the connection between the port and city. I think this is very important also uh, on the S, right, on the social. Uh, there is a huge uh, project in Brazil uh, to connect it to the two cities, Santos and Guarujá. Those two cities are, let's say, we have ports in these two cities, uh, and there is, uh, there is a huge uh, issue, which is the mobility. The mobility between the two cities is very, very hard. Uh, people spend many, a lot of time trying to um, go home or get, uh, uh, go to the, to the office, to the terminals, 
And more than that, uh, once we get this connection, we are engaging the government to build this tunnel, uh, of course, the quality of life of people will be much more improved. Uh, also, we could talk about the trains for terminal, or how can we remain competitive considering competition among ports. We, we could talk about how can we remain relevant uh, in logistics, considering the new technologies and also what is happening, uh, what we have, we have heard in this uh, TOC, for instance. Uh, we could talk also about how can we reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, there are many things to, to talk about. We can talk about smart ports as well. We can talk what are the bottlenecks with the smart ports. We can talk about uh, how to collect and manage the data, right? And this has been a, a challenge here in Europe. And in Brazil, for instance, we are just started with this process. Uh, but actually, I prefer to talk about another topic, uh, the topic about the investments and uh, how can we increase the capacity through vertical integrated terminals. And this has been one thing that we have discussed a lot in Brazil. But before going to the uh, presentation, uh, I would like to uh, talk about this beautiful country. Uh, Brazil has done, let's say, 80% of their, of our uh, uh, foreign trade by um, uh, via ports. 11% um, uh, is container. The rest is about bulk, steel, and, and another break bulk cargo. But 11% is related to our, uh, uh, I mean, container move count. Uh, we have, uh, which is about 12 million TUs. Um, from this 12 million TUs, 37% is through Santos, which is about 4.7 million TUs. And then we have more or less 40% or almost 40% of this volume done by BTP, almost 2 million uh, TUs. This is, or th those are numbers from uh, 2021. Uh, of course, there are many projects from the government trying to improve uh, the, the, the move count. Uh, uh, even with these numbers, uh, we are just 1.2% of the foreign trade. So it's very low comparing to the size of the country. Uh, the government has done a, a big efforts to improve those numbers. Uh, they have launched the new law of cabotage that called BR do Mar, uh, BR of the seas. Um, and also they have launched a lot of tenders, public tenders to, uh, to get or to attract investors to operate terminals in Brazil. Uh, but the main point is the country is huge, right? It's, uh, it's about 212 million people consuming, right? We have more than uh, 8.5 million square kilometers. We have 7.4 thousand kilometers of coast kissing the Atlantic uh, Ocean. Uh, but again, uh, with those uh, opportunities, uh, or, or with those numbers, just 1.2% of the market uh, when we talk about foreign trade. So it's very low and we want to find or to create these opportunities and turn it into uh, 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 infrastructure projects because this is what we will attract uh, uh, more demand or uh, we will increase the competitiveness and of course we will create more uh, trained, uh, tra uh, foreign trade for us. And then comes the opportunity. How can we speed up this process, right? Uh, for logistics, in our point of view, is with the vertical integration. This is pretty much important. Um, just to have an idea, one big difference between a vertical integrated terminal and a non-verticated uh, vertical integrated terminal is that the non-verticated, uh, non-vertical integrated terminal uh, used to invest only when the demand comes. The vertical integrated terminals we use to invest before the demands and of course creates an environment to attract more business. And that's what we want to do in Brazil. Uh, just to have an idea, that's the, uh, the, the, the relevant market in Brazil. Uh, we are discussing what is the, uh, the, the real relevant market for Santos Port. It's not only the three terminals that we have there. We have in Santos Port, we have uh, BTP, we have DP World, and also we have a local operator that calls Santos Brazil. But our relevant market is much uh, bigger than that. 
Uh, it's not only Santos, it's Rio de Janeiro. We have also ports in the south, Paranaguá, Santa Catarina. Uh, those ports compete uh, with Santos, right? Uh, and, and this is very important to understand because here in Europe, for instance, we have uh, some examples that not, not only ports uh, within the same country, but uh, ports uh, with different countries competing. So uh, we have Hamburg, we have Antwerp, we have Rotterdam competing uh, among themselves. So it's, it's very important to see uh, how, the, uh, how, how can we get this competition and how can we create more uh, uh, um, um, investments, uh, solutions to our customers. And this is the real uh, uh, reason why we are trying to develop or trying to uh, invest in terminals. The shipping lines, when they tried to do business and saw that the, uh, the core business was impacted because there was a lack of infrastructure in, in, in certain part of the world, they invested uh, in terminals. It was not because they want, because they need, because the customer was requiring that. And this is very important to say, uh, we are still uh, far behind what, uh, uh, comparing to the trend of what is happening here in Asia and also in Europe. And we have to follow this trend. If you go to the vertical integration, I don't know if you know this company, uh, sorry about that. I don't know if you, if you know this company here. That's Mercado Livre. Mercado Livre, uh, it's an Argentinian company. So uh, the biggest e-commerce that we have in South America, uh, actually um, they became a marketplace uh, that developed uh, and also uh, delivered the, uh, the goods uh, on the uh, customer house. Um, when they perceived that the, uh, the internal logistics starts to impact negatively the business and the other competitor was doing better than him or them, they decided to buy some assets to improve their logistics. And then they became not only an e-commerce or a, a marketplace to a, a company that sells and delivers the cargo uh, as, uh, uh, as per cu customer needs. So this is pretty much important because this is not only on the sea side. This happens on also on the air. And this is what we want to do. The, we have the, um, as a conclusion, I think it's important to, if you want to real uh, step up from this 1.2% uh, of the global trade, we have to find a ways not only to make some restrictions, uh, because there are some local operators that would like to block uh, vertical integrated terminals to participate on new tenders. But actually what we have to do is to invite those uh, uh, companies to, uh, uh, to invest in Brazil, to open the doors and say, hey, if you need to really give a very, let's say, to go up, you need the vertical integrated terminals. This is what we have to do at this point of time. The government is totally engaged on this. Uh, but uh, I, I still believe that uh, Brazil is not the country of the future anymore. We are here, right? We, are, we have proved that we have a huge, uh, uh, we are uh, a huge, uh, uh, we have a, a huge uh, ag agribusiness, for instance. Uh, we, we, we have proven also that uh, the BR Dumar, the new law, will improve the cabotage. We also... Uh, uh, we could see that we have, we have been prepared to receive vessels from 366-meter LOA vessels in Brazil, in Santos. Uh, all these investments, of course, will, be, uh, will not be uh, uh, a success if you don't have the, vert the vertical integrated terminals. So uh, this is what I have for today. It's crucial to be prepared for the new future, attending this demand, and I'm, I'm totally um, uh, confident that Brazil will reach the next uh, level of competitiveness with this kind of terminals. That's it. Thank you very much. I'll be pretty much uh, happy also to answer all questions that you have. Thank you. Ricardo, thank you very much indeed. I, I don't know about you, but I've sure got some questions. Uh, so please hang on to them uh, uh, for, until we've completed with our speakers. And our next uh, speaker is, is Pablo with De Real, who's the managing partner of ALG. And we're looking forward to your presentation. So good afternoon. Um, I was requested to talk about the interoperability and how this interoperability 
enhances and reinforces the... So, what I was saying, uh, I was requested to give a uh, short speech about uh, how interoperability enhances and reinforces the competitiveness of ports. And at the beginning, I was thinking that maybe it would be worth to explain what interoperability is. Now, at the end of the day, everybody knows already what interoperability is. We have been talking about this for years and years. No? And as a matter of fact, most of the people was uh, trying to focus on how interoperability enhances the supply chains by reducing the cost and reducing the lead times. No? So, first question that you could make yourself is, is this all that we have? Can we only focus on trying to optimize the cost and optimize the, the, the lead times? At the same time, uh, most of the people focus on, on containers, which is fair, bearing in mind the, the, the massive impact that they have on global trade. But they, and nevertheless, especially in the European market, we cannot forget that more than 55% of the overall trade is driven by bulk. And if you think about it, being able to improve the supply chains of commodities, being able to improve the cost, the lead times, and the service of these type of supply chains has a massive impact on the sustainability and the competitiveness of not only the trades, but also the ports. So I'm trying, to, what I've done today is I've brought two illustrative examples of how two different supply chains, the import of agribusiness and the export of steel, can take advantage of the, of the need to enhance and ensure the interoperability to further develop their business. It's not only about how we can ensure the interoperability, it's bearing in mind that we need to develop that, in the, that interoperability. What else can we do? Now, as a background, just as some key facts, agribusiness, as you know, agribusiness trade is dominated by, by traders. Traders are almost in every single stage of the supply chain up to the port of destination. They are, normally, they are not getting involved in the port of destination. While in the hinterlands, it's more regional or local distributors, the ones that play a major role, no? and it's a very fragmented market. That needs to be taken into account when we consider how a port operator can really make a difference in those trades. On the other hand, in steel trade, we have a completely different story. We have the, the, the manufacturers, the, the, the producers, the steel producers, that commonly are global players, Consequently, they are sourcing the raw material almost from everywhere while they have production nearer to their uh, final markets. So we are talking about a completely different setup and a completely different footprint. At the end of the day, also steel, uh, steel producers are getting more and more vertically integrated and, and, and that implies that they are getting involved in, much of the, uh, in many of the different stages of the supply chain. So how can a port operator make a difference through interoperability in these two supply chains. Starting with the first one, if I may, yes. Starting with the first one, first thing that we need to analyze is who has an impact on the supply chain, who makes the decisions, and which decisions each player takes. Because considering this, is the port operator needs to decide which are the main elements of the supply chain that he needs to focus on in order to improve its competitiveness. Now, from an agribusiness perspective, at the end of the day, as I was saying before, traders dominate completely the trade and the supply chain up to the port of destination, while we have a very fragmented market, very fragmented shareholder or st stakeholders in, in from, a, from a hinterland perspective, and consequently, at the end of the day, if you want to have an impact, you need to focus as port operator, and I'm talking about the European ports, the, the, the European ports that import this uh, type of cargo. As port operators, the only chance that we really have to, uh, to be able to enhance our competitiveness through helping this type of trades is by having an impact in the inland logistics. No? And at the end of the day, here the challenge is, okay, I want to be able to enhance that inland logistics, but I have 10, 15, 20 different players, which at the end of the day minimizes the sizes of those players. What can I do? One of the things that can be done, and that's the illustrative example that I brought today, is by developing infrastructure. What do I mean by this? What we, need to, what we are trying to uh, the, the example that I brought is bring the port nearer to your end consumption. 
bring the port, bring the infrastructure, invest in additional infrastructure, not only at your ports. You need to uh, perform at your ports. You need to have the cranes and the unloading facilities in order to have the performance that the traders are going to request from you in order to ens ensure that they are calling your terminal. But if you want to have an impact on the competitiveness and interoperability of the supply chains, you also need to go beyond the, the gate of the port and you need to invest in further uh, um, facilities beyond that, uh, that, that gate of the port. No? And, and for example, the intermodal the terminal in, in Monzon, in Spain, is a good example of this, that this inland depot was firstly meant only for containers. They tested the water with agribusiness, and what has happened is that agribusiness has become probably one of the main sources of revenues and profits of this terminal. So through trying to disrupt, trying to change the supply chains is how these guys have managed to become a major player of those supply chains. And what have they done? First thing is, let's analyze which are, which are our end locations or the locations of our end consumption. Let's try to locate ourselves in the center of gravity of those locations, and let's try to provide a differential value. If you think about it, the, the, these supply chains used to have trucks coming from the port 300, 400 kilometers delivering the, the goods, empty backhauling of 300, 400 kilometers, and it was all in small shipments with the small players, with the small providers. Now what is, has happened is that the port has become only 30 kilometers from the end destination. The breaking down of the cargo doesn't happen until that 30 kilometers from the end destination, and consequently, you have maximized the economies of scale, the synergies, and as a consequence, not as a target, as a consequence, both savings in, in cost and lead times have been achieved. Now, that would be the typical approach for interoperability. But what goes beyond this is the fact that once you have positioned yourself as partner of your, of your customers, you can start providing them much more services that will add revenue streams to your business plan. So it's not only a matter of investing in infrastructure to ensure the interoperability, it's take advantage of those, of those infrastructure in order to further develop your value proposition and consequently generate new revenue streams. Now, if we focus now on the, on the steel trade, this, as I was saying before, is a completely different story. We are com uh, completely different dynamics. Here we are talking about the exports, where at the end of the day, the global players, the global manufacturers have a major role in all the decision-making process of the logistics. And at the end of the day, the, the only way you can really have an impact is by trying to first of all, understand what are their main concerns. And for a, st a steel manufacturer, the main concern is, I cannot have any type of disruption in my, my, my production. And in order for that to happen, I need to ensure that I am able to take out the cargo from my facilities, the sooner, the better. That needs to be combined with the demand that you have locally and the demand that will be generated as an, an international export. So if you think about it, at the end of the day, the consequence of all this is that the connection, the shuttle service that needs to happen between the plant and the port is paramount. And how you manage your inventories and stocks, both at the plant and at the port, is the key success driver for this. So for the time being, it has been the producers who have been dealing with this challenge. And the port operator is, you bring me the cargo, I will handle the cargo but the rest is none of my business. On top of this, we are talking that many of these vessels have many different end customers, many different SKUs, many different uh, type of products that need to be handled, that have different uh, type of requirements of how they need to be handled, and consequently the complexity of, of the whole setup of the planning and execution of those supply chains is enormous. So how do we tackle this? It's by partnering with them in order to ensure that we become part of the solution. We are, we, the port operators need to stop thinking, and I'm a stage of the supply chain, I deliver the performance that I need to deliver in my yard and in my berth, and that's it, end of story. They need to go beyond that point. They need to become logistics partners of the customers in order to, first of all, understand what are their actual concerns, and secondly, provide the appropriate solutions that at the end of the day, 
they will achieve savings in cost, they will achieve savings in lead times, but is, what is more important, they will anchor cargo to their terminal while generating new revenue streams for their businesses. So at the end of the day, by solving a problem of your client, you are generating more business for yourself. Now, if you remember, when we were talking about agribusiness, we were, think, we were saying, you need to invest in infrastructure, you need to bring nearer the port to your end destinations. In this case, it's a completely different story. In this case, first of all, we need to vertically integrate, and at the end of the day, try to have more control over the supply chain, try to have more a say over the decisions that are being made from a logistics perspective, that's one. But what is more important is invest in technology and processes. Technology and processes. Technology and processes. Because at the end of the day, more and more, what we are going to see is that commodity-driven supply chains are going to demand the same level of traceability, control, monitor, and, and quality of services that, for example, the containers is used to receive now. So, and Brazil, I'm, I'm sure, is a good example of this. The, 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 more, the more we enhance the actual service that we are able to provide, the more we anchor the cargo to our terminal. It's not only a matter of investing in, I'm going to invest in bigger, higher, uh, quicker um, uh, cranes. It's not only about that. It's also about being able to provide a holistic solution, a holistic logistic solution that at the end of the day covers as much of the needs that each of these different supply chains have. And if you think about it, at the end of the day, agribusiness, um, steel, break bulk, everybody thinks it as a global, as one type of supply chain. I couldn't, couldn't disagree more. You need to fully I, I, I understand the specifics, the dynamics, the, the, the specifics not only of the product, but the specifics of, this, of the market, of the local market you, you, that you're dealing with. Because a steel manufacturer in Spain is completely different than a steel manufacturer in, the North, in North Europe or a steel manufacturer in India. It has nothing to do one with the other. So you need to go to the specifics in order to really understand what are the expectations that you need to fulfill. Now, at the end, as I was saying before, interoperability is a must. Everybody understands already this. And you need to have the infrastructure to deliver that interoperability. But interoperability is also an opportunity to further develop your value proposition. So you could do the business as usual, just the basics, I ensure the, um, the interoperability, I am focusing on, on performance, I am focusing on delivering the efficiency that the, my clients expect from myself, but I could, I oh, sorry, but I could also try to further develop my value proposition, further develop the services that I offer, further develop, as a matter of fact, how I mitigate the risks of losing a client, because as I am becoming a partner, I am anchoring that cargo to my terminal, and secondly, I'm also mitigating the risks of revenues, because I'm generating more revenue streams. So it's not only that you're helping your client, it's that you're helping your own business. So and just to wrap up, four main takeaways uh, of uh, everything that I've said today. Um, first of all, interoper interoperability has commonly been focused on, on purely savings on cost and, and lead times, which was a fair approach at the beginning. But I think um, that there's, secondly, there's, there's an opportunity here. We have an opportunity here to really go beyond what is the, 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 the bread and butter? What is the basics that someone can provide? And as a port operators, port operators need to more and more start thinking on, I'm no longer, you're no longer a stage of the supply chain. You need to have a global understanding of the supply chains so that you can really ha make a formed decision of what is the role that you want to play on those supply chains. And at the end of the day, the... the um, it's not um, only a matter of saving costs, it's not only a matter of, of reducing lead times, it's also a matter of making a change, become a game changer, have a disruptive logistic solution that makes a change in the, in the overall value chain. Let me put you an example. For instance, if they, in the, for the import of fertilizers, if you back those fertilizers at the beginning, in the port of, 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 uh, of uh, unloading, you change completely the, the supply chains. From, going to use, from having to use bulkers, you go to have to use flatbeds. And the management of those trucks is completely different. 
Obviously, it implies an investment. Obviously, it implies a risk, a financial risk of trying to develop a service that is, for the time being is not there. But at the same time, you're making a massive change in, in the mindset of not only your clients, of how business is done in that specific sector in your hinterland. No? And finally, the, the, um, again, this interoperability has to be seen as an opportunity to further develop our value propositions. We cannot drive ourselves only purely by performance, bigger, bigger beds, uh, the, uh, deeper beds, bigger uh, cranes, um, and more efficient yards. We need to go beyond that point. Uh, ports need to become a catalyst of what the, the supply chains are uh, all around the world. Thank you. I don't, don't know about you, but I feel a bit breathless after that. I mean, I think we got about 40 minutes of data in just over 10 minutes. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds just to catch your breath. Um, one of the things I forgot to say, and I must apologize to our erstwhile speakers, is that we operate a demurrage system here. So that if you go over time, there is a penalty charge, which is measured in martinis, and I reckon I'm up by about three or four at the moment, so I'm looking forward to this evening. I won't tell you who the speakers are. We'll have a private conversation about that later. But in the meantime, let's hand over to uh, Hans Rook, who's the chairman of the International Port Community Systems Association. Let me see whether you can handle this. Yes, it does work. I come back to the first slide at the very end. That's much easier to, uh, to understand for you, I hope, because that's, that's the puzzle, that's the question mark for today. But for today is, uh, is the what if, if question, actually. Today we are in Rotterdam, my, my hometown, where I've been born, I lived my whole life, and I worked around the clock um, in the port, in the port area, on logistics, etc., etc. Look into the figures of the port of Rotterdam. We know that the number of TUs handled last year was about 15.3 million TU. That works out when you make a simple division um, in 24, uh, 42,000 a day. Each of those containers will have been handled at least four times. Well, it, it depends on from which aspect you look at it. Unloading, stack in, stack out, reload, and onwards, and vice versa for exports. That adds up to 168,000 handlings, only from terminal operator point of view, because there are much more handlings of a container. Actually, when you look at all the stakeholders around and in the port using the systems to get information, track and trace information about the data for the container, you will find up that it ups, ends up to a, about 100 hits on each and every container that is discharged. So the calculation is much more than I made the very simple um, overview over here. Well, when you think about this continual shuffling of the containers around the clock and around the terminals, the potential of chaos is obvious. But how does it work? But it works. How does it? Here we come to information. The smooth flow of containers depends on the smooth flow of information. It is vital not only to keep track on the container handling within the terminal, but also to keep track on the many stakeholders involved, informed, and up-to-date. Data sharing is the key. Without efficient, streamlined, secure system-to-system -system communication, reporting, handling, these enormous quantities of containers would be impossible. Here we are talking about the biggest port of Port of Europe, but in reality, the same applies for the ports globally, big, medium, or small. The smooth, efficient flow of cargo through a port depends absolutely on the smooth and efficient flow of information. A port community system, as a trusted third party, neutral third party, provides the electronic platform to enable this. The development of a port community system and single window systems has gathered pace around the world. In recent years, especially after the pandemic, people did realize that paper handling needs to stop. A number of factors in this case 
In our global economy, trade volumes continue to increase, and supply chains have become even more complex and critical. The World Trade Organization, the, the Trade Facilitation Agreement signed in February 2017, a milestone, setting out the path towards harmonization, standardization, and improved information gathering. The TFA was designed to make international business cheaper, faster, and easier, helping to cut trade costs globally by about 14.3%. Port community systems are at the heart of this, enabling better, faster data availability to improve the supply chain with cost reduction as a spin-off. The acceleration of digitalization throughout the maritime sector, especially in response to COVID-19 pandemic, is also one of the factors. And last month, a push came from the IMO, the IMO fall, that from May 2022, it was uh, announced that the use of single window systems all around the world for ships' data exchange became mandatory as per the 20, 2024. So the smooth, efficient flow of cargo through the port depends absolutely on the smooth and efficient flow of information. What, what is the role of the International Port Community System Association, IPCSA? Well, IPCSA represents sea and airport community system operators, sea and airport authorities, and single window operators around the world. IPCSA has expanded this rapidly in both membership and influence since it was founded in 2011, so a young association actually. Last year we celebrated our 10th anniversary with a decade of achievements. Port community systems play such a critical role at the heart of millions of smooth cargo flows every day. And yet, before IPCSA was founded, port community systems operators did not have a voice. There were no organization around it, no lobbying presence, and no common champion for their causes. When IPCSA started in 2011, our immediate, rate, our immediate priority was to tell the European politicians and decision makers what the port community system actually does. The concern was that the policy makers working on the European Mar Maritime Single Window from 2010 seemed far too keen to reinvent the wheel. But let's get back to today. Today, IPCSA acts on a global level on behalf of our members. We are recognized by and work with the United Nations, International Maritime Organization, World Customs Organization, World Trade Organization, the World Economic Forum, and many, many more, I can tell you. We create awareness about the existence of a value of port community systems and single window operators globally. We work hard to get, it, to get the message across. Port community systems and single window systems deliver extraordinary reduction in handling time, port operations, and costs in the port where they exist. This is exactly in line with the aims and aspirations of the Trade Facilitation Agreement I mentioned earlier. It's all about interoperability. There are numbers, numerous so-called use cases of case studies where the introduction of port community systems has reduced delays in ports from months to weeks, from weeks to days, and from hours to minutes even. Without system-to-system -system communication, without interoperability, by using international standards as far as possible in communication of logistic data, this would have been impossible. Apart from our efforts to emphasize the importance of a port community system, a part of any port's critical infrastructure, IPCSA has taken the lead in creating a unique cross-border data exchange platform between port community systems and single window operators. Oh, sorry, I have to go back. Right. It's our network of trusted networks. Am I on the right slide? I don't know anymore. <laughs> Let me see the next slide then. Yeah, it's this one. That's right. That's the right one. Sorry. So, our network of trusted networks enables vessel, vessel voyage and cargo tracking. Track and trace information to flow easily and securely between trusted, neutral, third-party platforms. Getting rid of black holes of the information along the supply chain. 
And we all know that the supply chain relies on all the information and the weakest link makes it difficult to get everything done in the right way. This information is exchanged in a trusted and secure way based on the neutrality of the, par of the parties of, and the parties. And, of course, this data exchange is only authorized on behalf of the customers of the port community systems. No data is stored on the exchange platform. It is stored only on the platform of the port community system that receives the data. It is up to, up to the sending port community system on behalf of the customers of the port community system, which data is allowed to be uploaded to the receiving port community system. The network trusted network is enabling an additional step in improving trade facilitation and in line with today's subject, interoperability, port interoperability, by adding additional features for the fast and smooth delivery of cargos and containers. The past few years, there it goes, the past few years have certainly taught us, taught us all, that we can never know what next, crisis will, what next crisis will be. What we have also learned is that sometimes a crisis helps to see what we must do together. That was particularly the case when the Ever Given got stuck in the Suez Canal. A lot have forgotten that already in the meantime. We all remember the queues that were built up as world's container ships waited to enter the canal, such a vital artery for shipping. Of course, there was soon enormous demands from the shippers, waiting to know where the cargo was and when it, or it might have arrived. Difficult to, uh, to get it done. What has been done by the uh, port community system operators on the coastal side of Europe, they made a website, each of them made a website, where with key information the shippers could find the information they needed to know about the ships, about the cargo and the whereabouts on the sea. That site has been hit a huge number of times in the very beginning because the people were puzzled. Where is my cargo? When does it arrive? On which terminal will it arrive? Because all the ships cannot come to one terminal. On the physical side, collaboration between the terminals operators was crucial. When the blockage of the Suez Canal was finally cleared, of course, it was like the, the cork of a bottle. With hundreds of vessels suddenly all heading the same way at the same time, it was collaborating between the terminals that smoothed out the situation, avoiding the huge delays that would have resulted from arrival of the many vessels at the same port at the same time in a few days. And that collaboration is something that is still in my mind, that you have a lot of competitors on terminals in your port, in your home port, also in the port of Rotterdam, having contracts with the carriers themselves, are fighting on tariffs, are fighting on the best performance. And then you see, when something happens like this, that collaboration is possible. They helped each other, they took care that all the vessels could come into the port area at the same time and were discharged and loaded again in time. So that was a good way to see how collaboration can work. But think about this. Interoperability and collaboration can only happen if, they, if everyone understands each other. That requires standardization and harmonization of data. While the port community system and single window is the enabler for everybody to engage the, in the community of the port area, the only work because everyone shares the data in a standard way. As an organization, IPCSA is a champion standing on the pulpit to embrace standardization and harmonization and is strongly committed to this. IPCSA is uh, home to the Protect Group, which develops and supports the electronic reporting requirements by authorities for vessels entering and leaving the port area. Protect has closely links to UNCFACT and the IMO 4 committee and many others. Last year, Protect became fully integrated into IPCSA. Together, IPCSA and Protect will continue to maintain and develop, promote EDI through the Protect Guide. IPCSA members should be proud on this achievement, but in the main, they are focusing ahead, developing and refining solutions and services that makes a real difference for all involved in our complex global supply chain. To end this session, 
I will emphasize, this is global industry. Anything that happens in an international port on one side of the world will have huge impact on an international port at the other side of the world. Look what's happening with the lockdown in Shanghai. Look what's happening with the uh, Silk Road, which cannot pass by Ukraine and Russia these days. So it's a complete block at this moment. So it, it has a lot of impact on Europe and, uh, of course, on the other side, on China as well. There cannot be a black hole in information. Information is so important. Interoperability is key for port performance. But there can be interoperability without collaboration between stakeholders in and around the port. We need collaboration, common standards, and a real willingness to change. Our Secretary General, uh, Richard Morton, said, port community systems, here we go, port community systems and single window are based on same principles and will same, will, with the same purpose, to enable the efficient, secure transfer of electronic information through a single entry point, hence eliminating paperwork and duplication, and thereby supporting the swift and smooth movement of goods through the port and the wider supply chain. Really, my last slide, ladies and gentlemen, and it comes back to the first slide. Um, I leave you now with a 400-year-old quote of the English philosopher Francis Bacon. I'm not Francis Bacon Jr., but it was Francis Bacon. The first and best one is ipsa scientia potestas est, meaning knowledge itself is power. I like to think that four centuries ago he was imagine, imagining that port community systems of the future. The second one, by far the best proof in experience. I won't pronounce the Latin one. And of course, that was what IPCSA's member offer. And to stop this presentation and to the next generation here available, here uh, uh, attending the meeting, the future is built on history. Let the future be soon your history to improve the transport supply chain in the coming decades. Thank you. Well done indeed to Hans Rook for his intimate local knowledge and his international outlook. Um, and uh, to make sure we've got a few minutes left for Q&A, we're going to move straight on to Jerome Katz from uh, TBA Group. Yeah, thank you. Thank you also for still being here. I heard the party already got started somewhere. Um, I'm going to talk to today about crosstalk facilities, uh, and specifically crosstalk facilities as ports. Um, also, so if, we, if you look at uh, in the recent years, a, we see a lot of crosstalks being developed, um, also in, in the port industry and specifically also adjacent to port facilities. Uh, also some of our customers traditionally, uh, those are the terminal operators, they're now looking, hey, we, we have normally the warehousing, we have the ports on the one side, and now they're moving more and more closer together. And um, you see a few examples here, for instance, a mass factor two uh, is going to have a large cross dock facility by 2023. Also, the Georgia Ports Authority is developing a near dock uh, facility uh, at their site. So that's what you see the uh, lower rendering at the bottom, and where you see the cross dock uh, with some storage, and in the background you see the container terminal. So it's uh, a connected facility, so it's an internal road, and so trucks don't have to go via the public road. They have immediately have access to the, uh, to the cross dock. And, well, as I said, why are those... Oh, I think the batteries, it's assuming that the battery is... Uh, so, in, in general, and it's not only for the cross docks uh, near uh, terminals, uh, why do we see the development on the cross docks? I mean, it's uh, on one hand a demand for faster delivery times. Uh, customers want their uh, ordering their packages, they want them faster. Uh, and on the other hand, we have in the last years the congestion in ports uh, and also in warehousing. I mean, we see a shortage on staff, uh, the whole supply chain is, is slowing down, and still there's demand for how can we get the cargo faster. And that's also where the cross docks come into play and where they don't move the cargo first to the close by warehouse, immediately it goes to the cross dock and it goes inland. 
And so that's why we see quite a demand for it. Of course, it's also about the cost, you know, reducing the inventory, uh, getting to the uh, customer faster, uh, but also reducing the uh, transport costs. And uh, also those, as you know, have gone up quite considerably in the last two years. So how can we increase the efficiency and reduce the cost of transport? Yeah, and there the crosstalk or transload facilities come into play. Um, so as said today, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the crosstalk facilities, not in general, but uh, what do they mean to having a crosstalk facility at the port next to the terminal? Now it goes. So, I want to touch on three key benefits for the port area uh, in general of having that close by, as you've seen in the example, so really next door to the container terminal. And so the first one is it reduces traffic uh, congestion in the port area, and I'll explain all three in a little bit more detail as we, as we go. So that's really for the port community, where of course trucking and the increased cargoes and more trucks, it is always of course a struggle uh, with the community. So. How can Crosstalk help in that uh, aspect, not only for traffic, but also for, of course, the uh, uh, emissions? Uh, second one is uh, increased container availability and potentially specifically for the US, also chassis availability, uh, where a lot of the truckers use other chassis uh, and where some ports say, well, they're out of chassis, so truckers are waiting the whole day to get a hand on the chassis before they can pick up a container. Uh, and last one is more focused on the uh, container terminal. It can assist increasing the capacity of the container terminal. Uh, I'll touch base on all three. So I've, I've tried to uh, make some nice schematics. I'm not particularly good at it, so I'll, I'll try to explain uh, a little bit the crosstalk and how that impacts the uh, container traffic. So what we he see on your left is, uh, so we have a container terminal at the bottom. We have uh, uh, containers moving to the hinterland, either directly uh, going, uh, let's say, two, three hundred kilometers inland or further by truck, or we have what we often see also, and in some of the examples we've been working on, uh, is, is, is local distribution center, other side of the town, and so trucks pick up the container, drive down through the town, drop it off at the uh, local distribution center where it's being offloaded, and then uh, at a later time, trailers pick up the cargo, uh, and move it further into the hinterland to the other distribution centers. And like I said, and the direct flow. So, uh, and I've tried to do a little bit schematic here, but what you often see is, of course, the trailers, especially in the US, but also in things, are more efficient, so we can put more cargo in the trailers. Uh, so, trying to represent that, let's say, three, uh, three, three containers versus two trailers, probably not the exact number, but uh, it's more efficient to use trailers. So what if we introduce a cross dock, and I, with that I mean really next door to the container facility uh, so that it is internally connected uh, with the port. Um, so we have that at the bottom, really tied to the terminal. What does that do? So it has some, some benefits. So of course we can't do every cargo, not every container can directly go via that cross dock, but a part of the flow we can capture via the cross dock. Uh, whereas we still have the flow to the local DC, and, but there's also a specific part of the flow that can immediately move to the crosstalk, uh, where then uh, it's being transloaded to the trailers. Uh, whereas we can eliminate basically a part of the container flow directly moving through the city, preventing congestion in the port area and reducing the overall traffic that we see in the port. Uh, same holds true where if it directly goes to the hinterland, um, where if we go via the crosstalk and immediately uh, put the containers into uh, larger trailers. It basically means less trucks, uh, also more efficient from cost point of view, especially with the cost of transport, also uh, difficult and also getting truck drivers actually is also very troublesome in a lot of locations. Uh, so that really helps to reduce the container traffic in the port area. And with that, of course, also emissions and everything that comes with it. Um, yeah, then I already said, uh, mentioned for all specifically in the US, for instance, the uh, chassis and container availability uh, with warehousing often being full at the moment. What we see is often the container sits longer in port or they're transferred to the warehouse, but they sit there for a couple of days before they can actually be handled. And so occupying a, a the containers, but also the chassis that are unavailable because they're occupied by uh, the containers. And so what we see is with the, the availability of a crosstalk, 
bring the containers there. You don't need a chassis or something else because it's used by internal transport. Uh, and as soon as it's being uh, discharged uh, at that cross dock or emptied and moved into the uh, availability of the uh, trailer, that container immediately becomes available to go back to the supply chain and also the chassis remains available. Uh, so that frees up the, the equipment. Uh, yeah, and that, that, that helps quite a bit to solve that problem as well, or to alleviate, and won't solve it entirely. And that, uh, perhaps the last one, specifically for the adjacent terminal, what we see is it can assist in increasing the throughput capacity of the uh, container terminal. And where we see a lot of terminals, uh, trucks, well, warehouses are typically open, uh, open up early in the morning, close at the end of the day. So also all the traffic going there will typically arrive at the container facility during daytime hours. And so even though some containers terminals are open 24 hours, very little trucks arrive at night. Um, well, the idea with the cross dock is that we, instead of an external truck picking up that particular container, it's being done by an internal truck. So you could do it at the convenience of the container terminal when there's uh, basically capacity available. And so you would be able to move those containers towards the cross dock facility outside of your busy uh, gate hours. And that allows you to basically utilize the equipment more flexibly. And for instance, let's say we have we can handle 200 trucks per hour. If 50 of them have to go to the cross dock, we can take them out of that hour, handle them at night, in the evenings, or very early mornings. And it gives me another 50 spot for basically another 50 trucks in that hour. So I'm trying to basically spread out truck flow during the day uh, by doing my internal moves to the cross dock in my off hours and really utilizing the equipment. Uh, and potentially, uh, yeah, we've seen dwell times increase rapidly, but containers aren't moving. Uh, by utilizing the cross dock, we can get containers off-site, creating also more space on the terminal. Well, what we see here is, is one example of a, a, a cross dock that we evaluated for a customer. For, so what does it do, especially for the container terminal? On well, this particular case, yard capacity was not uh, a problem. They had plenty of space still, but handling was a constraint. They had a fixed amount of equipment. Uh, difficult to add more, and where they were stuck at about 1.2 million lift capacity per year. But by moving uh, cargo to the cross docks, doing the moves at moments they can actually, are basically underutilizing, they were able to push basically uh, handling capacity of the facility to 1.4 million uh, lifts. And so that allows you, and it shows that, hey, by utilizing the cross dock, it also benefits the container facility as well. So, in summary, I tried to keep it a little bit short, given the time, but uh, and those, those cross dock facilities at the port uh, yeah, are basically needed for capacity. I mean, there's a short of warehouse space, uh, the, 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 the whole market is slow, so this speeds up the, the delivery times of the cargo. Uh, secondly, is, uh, it's comp it will support in the traffic congestion in port areas, trying to keep trucks out. And, and reduce the, the whole truck flow, as well as the carbon footprint. Uh, frees up the equipment, containers, chassis, helps that. And of course, last but not least, uh, increases the efficiency and capacity of the facilities uh, where they're placed. So there are, in that sense, quite a few benefits of having those cross dock facilities. And it's also, I think, the reason why we're seeing a lot of our customers uh, are really evaluating what does it do for us. And uh, yeah, it's definitely picking up and yeah, being looked into. And that was it. Thank you. Uh, Jerome, thank you very much indeed for um, your excellent presentation and welcome to the speakers back onto the podium. We've got some time left for, for questions. Um, uh, I thought Jerome's presentation on cross docking was really interesting and, and I wonder you know, why we haven't done more of this uh, uh, in, uh, in the past, whether it, relates, whether it relates to capacity on the terminal, whether it relates to the coordination and communication with the final customer, and, it, and perhaps that might be something that Hans Rook's uh, uh, Port Community System has, has helped. Uh, also interested in the, the, some of the statistics that came out today, and I was quite surprised at the small percentage that, that containers occupy in terms of trade, but I wasn't sure whether we were talking volume or whether we were talking value, uh, but we can, we can come back to that. Uh, so um, 
I know it's nearly time for drinks, uh, but you can't go until you've asked at least three decent questions. Uh, I can see that I've got um, some of my independent port consultant colleagues that have uh, joined us, which makes me feel a little bit more secure, but a bit nervous because I know they're good at asking difficult questions. Uh, but over to you on the floor, uh, who'd, who'd, like to, who'd like to ask the first question? I'm, I'm very good at volunteering people where there are people in the audience I know by name. So, uh, Mr. Fossey, um, <laughs> would you like to go first? Well, Steve, you put me on the spot and I don't really have a question, to be honest with you. But um, I will ask a question to Hans Rook, actually. And um, I understand the value of port community systems. But if they really work effectively, and if they provide interchange of data between all stakeholders in the port community, why do we have so much congestion? Yeah, I, I think you, you cannot say it's one or one is two in this case. Uh, congestion is more the physical distribution of the cargo. And don't forget, it depends on which kind of port you're looking at. There are a lot of ports in, in, around the world that do not have PCS at all. But when you look at the, at the ports where PCS is operating, especially in Europe, um, and we see a lot of development going on in, in Brazil these days, uh, but especially in Europe, you see that uh, the port make a lot of advantages of that. The congestion in the port is in sometimes a luxury problem. A luxury problem, I mean, the huge vessels having 20,000 TUs on board discharge the containers in one go, let's say eight or 9,000 in the port, and they have to bring, to bring them inland. And then it, it is not about a PCS, not about the interoperability, not about the, the, the information flow, but at that moment, it stocks in the infrastructure in the background. The real infrastructure, roads, rail, and barge. That's the problem. Jeff, if... Sorry, yeah, so it's only going to be effective if the infrastructure within the port itself is developed to a certain certain level. Yeah, that, 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 that's one of the problems. I, I know the infrastructure in the port of Rotterdam, that's why it's the port number one of Europe these days, because the infrastructure is quite well. But even the port of Rotterdam is struggling with the, uh, let's say, the delivery of the containers inland, because the number of containers that the crane can handle on the seaside is not in balance with the number of containers that a crane for rail, road or truck can handle the same way. So you see an imbalance in, in physical operations on the seaside and on the inland side. And that makes it much more difficult. And that's why when you look at port community systems, and, and I'm very happy to, uh, to, to note and, and to be well, one of the founding members of the port community system in the port of Rotterdam in 2002, um, what we have seen is the multi-model these days is uh, imperative to be used. So a lot of containers move by barge or rail to an inland depot or to an inland terminal. And from there, it takes for the last mile, as we always uh, uh, use the definition, for the last mile, the truck. And using a PCS to, uh, to get, let's say, uh, the, the transparency in data, which containers are where, and what is available on the inland depot, how can we move it from two or three modes of transport without any any hustle in between, no delays. Uh, I think that's one of the topics for today and tomorrow to work out more that you release the port area from trucks as much as possible. Apart from the cross docking, which is also a part, but especially over here, the multimodal, to take out the trucks, so uh, receive the COT reduction as we need to have as much as possible. And we talk about the COT reduction, for instance, I see three levels. It's the, the fuel which has to be changed, is the mode of transport which has to be changed, and the third level is logistics. And those three together will make it work. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll ask one more question, Steve, so we can get for those drinks. Um, in terms of cross-docking versus inland port uh, type of operations, what do you believe is the most effective in terms of helping to alleviate congestion on a terminal? And that's basically to... Uh, your own and um, to Alexia. I mean, we see both happening. Uh, so obviously, we, we see several terminals. Uh, for instance, the example uh, of GPA, they, they have developed the, the, this cross dock, but in addition, they're having those inland depots or small uh, rail terminals that they develop inland where they put shuttle trains to and do, uh, do trucks there. So I think they can go hand in hand. So it's not uh, one of the two. 
Uh, and that's also what we see, sort of trying to get ways of how can we get cargo out of the port, out of the congested areas, to better accessible areas with more land, uh, so they go hand in hand, yeah. The panel like to comment. Wait, I can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I can add something on the, on the first one. Because, I mean, this one I'm not very expert on, but coincidentally, even if I was talking about OPS, we, we run as a company port community system in the port of Trieste. So I can uh, a bit ask to the, to the uh, answer to the first, to the first question. Uh, I think uh, what is really important in the in a port community system is that, of course, is alleviating, in a way, uh, the deficit of, of infrastructure, or real infrastructure. And this could reach a certain level. Then infrastructure is, is what they are. If you lack some of infrastructure, it what it is. Uh, what a, an example I could give to you is that uh, in, in Trieste we are now having a s certain kind of uh, traffic light to, st uh, to stack uh, trailers in, the inland term in an inland terminal that is very close to the port before arriving to the port in order to alleviate the congestion in the last 10 kilometers. This is an example of, of what a PCS could do, but at, at the very end of the game the limit of infrastructure is what it is and, and you cannot supersede that in a way, but you can alleviate this. Very good, thank you. Who would like to ask a question from the, uh, from the audience? Here at the front. Please don't forget to tell us who you are and who you work with. Suhail Mahin is my name. I'm from Hamburg Port Consulting and quite new in the business uh, to this industry. And what puzzles me coming from different industries is this level of this non-willingness to share. I find it so amazing that there's a kind of thinking which is so rigid, hierarchical, doesn't want to share, and believes while not sharing to get everything and keep everything. For me, it's not a technological problem. I mean, it's so obvious that you need to share data in order to avoid congestion. I mean, you don't need to study to know that. What is I think really preventing any kind of innovation in our industry is that kind of rigidity in the mindset of the people not understanding or being able and willing to share in order to change things in a chain where it is so bloody obvious that one needs and depends on the other person in order to have, let's say, a service level, as you put it very beautifully, Alexio, which serves all our customers and where we all depend on interacting with each other. I mean, that's logistic, isn't it? So can you please educate me why this kind of mentality prevails in an industry which depends on each other? Shall I? Yeah? Thank you, Thank you for the question. Um, uh, obvious, tomorrow I have another meeting, not here, but I have another meeting in, in Dubai even. And there I speak about data sharing. And the topic, or let's say the words to start is, is sharing is scary. What we find out all over the world, and my topic in, 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 um, in PCS development, whatever the development, is stakeholder management and change management. Uh, we always say um, PCS is not an IT system, PCS is all about change management. When you have a <coughs> box of cards in your hand and you don't have players, it's nice to have the box of cards, but you cannot use it. It's the same with the IT system being a PCS, and when you don't have the players collaborating with each other, working with each other, sharing with each other, you can figure out about the working and how to get it done. And then you have to go back to the fundamental things, and the fundamental thing is communication. Communication and communication. Make it transparent to the CEO and to the people, of the CEO also to the people on the work area. Because when we came with PCS development at a certain moment and change management, you go to a company and people are looking to each other and say, oh, he's coming to ruin my job. And that's not the case. So then they hold back. So you have to be very open, very transparent what's going to happen. You have to change your mindset. And I always say, when I talk to people, you did already because you're using an iPhone, you're using an Android phone these days. You didn't 20 years ago, so you have changed already. And then you see the mindset is going different in a different way. And being sharing the data means what are you going to share? Uh, 
Um, I can imagine that, that uh, shipping agents, forwarding agents, the carriers and terminals and each other will not share each other's data in total. But it is about the data that they do already share by paperwork. Sending paper to bilateral to, to person one or have a phone call to person two. And now you get a system where you can share the data and you will find out that there's one truth of information, one truth of data, which makes it much more easier for all parties to be used. But it's a long, long way to go. And it's all about communication, all about transparency to do so. Yeah? I, I think most of the panel share your frustration, but we'll let, we'll let them speak. Think. Think. Oh. <laughs> now, I, was, I was going to say that the mirror that we should look at is the aviation sector, where they have an obligation to share the information. It's, 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 no, it's, not, it's not whether they are willing to share the information, it's that they have an obligation to share the information. And whenever there is any, a smallest issue, all the information needs to be shared among all the different stakeholders. But if you also allow me a joke, careful what you wish, because if they share all the information, then the consultants, we are no longer required. So... Thank, thank, thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to just, as we wrap up, I'd like to come back to... Alexio was talking about um, his Shore Power uh, initiative with uh, 10 T ports. And as we move through the cycle of changing the different fuel oils on ships uh, uh, and, and moving away from the traditional heavy fuel, which has generated the socks and knocks that's been so concerning for, for ports, and uh, moving to the interim fuels of LNG and LPG and then onto ammonia and hydrogen, then does that mean we'll get to a stage, in fact, ships become more um, environmentally friendly than the generation of shore power? Uh, yeah, yes, that is a trend for sure. Uh, it's a trend that is not very linear, let me say, because uh, since a couple of years ago, from specifically uh, from the European Commission side, there was, uh, not only, there was a push on the LNG, and that means that uh, offer and demand raised up uh, in terms of uh, bunkering, in terms of new, uh, new buildings, uh, ships with LNG. And, th and then 2020 uh, onwards, they totally switched to, 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 to other things, such as hydrogen, ammonia, and things like that. That is making life a little bit complicated for, for the maritime sector, because as you can understand, when you have a new building, it's for 25 years. And so you need to, you need to, to do the right choice. And most of the, most of the companies, they are, they are waiting also for this not clear framework in terms of, uh, uh, not even legislative, that is still to come, Fit for 55 with the new regulation on alternative fuel, the EU fuel maritime storage. Even the framework on the legislative side is, is coming, but also how the, the market is evolving. So, in a way, OPS, Cold Iron, is, is really a portion of all the different, uh, of the different possibilities, and it has to be combined with the, with the others, and it certainly is not easy. Certainly, it's something where consultants could, go, <laughs> could be helpful in, the, in this respect. Uh, but um, it's, it's a very challenging task for uh, ship owners and, and maritime sector now. Thank, thank you very much. Now, before we wrap up, I'm just going to ask our erstwhile speakers if there's anything else they'd like to add from, from what they've heard today. Um, uh, uh, one, uh, one from uh, Hans Rook. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming back on your question. Um, have a look at two methods of, uh, of uh, let's say, including the people where you talk to and where you go hand in hand to new development. That's cotters and bridges. Look at cotters and bridges at the methodology and you will find out that that is kind of way to get them more involved in the process from the very beginning till the end and make your ambassador. So you're not talking a lot. No, they will be your ambassador and they will come around and say, you should do it that way, you should do it this way. Please look at cotters and bridges. Right? Okay, I've actually got two or three more questions, but I'm not going to burden you with them, but I'll try and catch um, Ricardo and Pablo uh, afterwards, and we can perhaps have a chat over one of those martinis that I mowed from the speakers. Thank you all very much for, for being here. I hope you found it an interesting session. We've certainly galloped through lots of things and delivered a lot of information, so I hope you've managed to keep up. I, and you're probably aware that the presentations will all be available on, online 
after the event. Now, tomorrow morning, starting at 10 o'clock, we have another speaker from the EU, and uh, she will be talking about the, the regulations in terms of uh, the, the fuels for, for ships, which will carry on some, some of the dialogue that we've already had. But in the meantime, thank you all very much indeed for your attention this afternoon. I can see uh, a quick straw poll showed that 99% of you managed to stay awake throughout this afternoon session. And in particular, thanks to the speakers. They've done a lot of preparation, uh, given us a lot of information. Gentlemen, you've been great this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed.